This is the story of a proud and flamboyant man who was the first black boxer ever to win one of the most prestigious titles in sports. Between the years 1908 and 1915, he ruled the heavyweight division as no man had before him. But at the turn of the 20th century, his carefree lifestyle was despised by many of his fellow countrymen. A cry for the great white hope echoed across the land as sports fans awaited his downfall. Today, his legend lives on as one of the most controversial figures in the history of sports. But he remains one of boxing's best, Jack Johnson. story of Jack Johnson. And now from New York City, here is your host, Barry Tompkins. Hello everybody, I'm Barry Tompkins and welcome to Boxing's Best. This is the story of boxing's first black heavyweight champion. Jack Johnson was born in 1878 of parents who were slaves. He was born in Galveston, Texas, but left home at the age of 12 to work. He worked for a while as a sponge fisherman. He was a painter. He was a potato peeler. He worked on the docks and started fighting at the age of 13. He had his first professional fight at the age of 16 years. Here, the city of New York, which was one day to be his home, was still thousands of miles away and years to come. Jimmy Jacobs is boxing's preeminent historian. And Jimmy, I think it's safe to say that Jack Johnson came along much too soon and perhaps generations ahead of his time. I would say so, Barry. Actually, Jack Johnson was a half a century ahead of his time. He was the first fighter who thought about self-preservation when he got into the ring. In fact, all of the films of all of the fighters around the turn of the century, the fighters actually impaled their face on the other man's gloves in order to get their own punches in. Jack Johnson was absolutely unique. He fought for three decades, and when he was through fighting at a very old age, if your life depended on it, you, couldn't, you could not determine that he was a professional fighter. That was really something. Jimmy, what was the reaction of the American public to a black man who was coming along and having an eminence in a sport that was predominantly a white man's sport at that time? Well, in 1907, 1906, when Jack Johnson was demonstrating that he was the greatest heavyweight in the world, at that time there had been five white heavyweight champions, Sullivan, Corbett, Fitzsimmons, Jeffries, and uh, Tommy Burns. Interestingly enough, Jack Johnson had to chase Tommy Burns all over the world in order to get a shot at the heavyweight championship. But at that time, the public did not want a black man to be the heavyweight champion of the world. And it was indeed a difficult task for Johnson to even get a fight for the world championship. It didn't stop at the government, as a matter of fact, and at the people. It actually stopped all the way at the government to try to stop Jack Johnson from the heavyweight title. Well, that's true. Uh, when Johnson beat Burns in 1908 for the heavyweight championship, and Jeffries came out of retirement in order to try to uh, beat Johnson, when they couldn't find a white heavyweight to beat Jack Johnson, the government passed a law, the Mann Act, in order to get Jack Johnson and get the heavyweight championship back to the white race. It was in 1905 that Jack Johnson started looking for Tommy Burns. It was to be a three-year search. He finally caught up with the man all the way in Australia. Jack Johnson chased heavyweight champion Tommy Burns all over the world for the title he wanted so desperately. Burns insisted on drawing the color line, denying leading black contenders like Jack Johnson, Joe Jeanette, and Sam Langford a shot at the title. But wherever Tommy Burns went, Jack Johnson would follow. Johnson and his manager, Sam Fitzpatrick, borrowed thousands of dollars and pursued the champion in France, England, and then finally back in Sydney, Australia. While Burns was fighting less competitive European and Australian contenders, Jack Johnson was defeating the likes of former champion Bob Fitzsimmons. Tommy Burns had won the title by decisioning Marvin Hart in 1906. It was Hart who claimed the vacated heavyweight title when James J. Jeffries announced his retirement in 1905. Jack Johnson had issued public challenges to all three champions, 
In each case, he was ignored. Finally, in 1908, after seeing both Burns and Johnson in action, some English reporters wrote that Johnson was Burns' master. Jack Johnson was ecstatic over the public pressure. And Tommy Burns was visibly upset. The champion tried eluding Jack by heading for France and then Australia. But Jack Johnson followed him everywhere. Promoter Hugh McIntosh guaranteed Burns $30,000, while Jack Johnson received $5,000. For the first time in history, a black man was fighting for the heavyweight championship of the world. This was not just a fight. Jack Johnson had the opportunity to gain dignity for an entire race that was still living in the aftermath of the Civil War. December 26, 1908, Rush Cutters Bay at 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Round one. 26,000 fans hold their breath. Burns is defending for the 12th time. At 6 feet 1 and 212 pounds, Johnson is lean and hard, a master craftsman who loves to set his own pace. Burns looks for an opening but is tied up. The challenger moves the champion around at will. The man in the white suit, promoter Hugh McIntosh. The press knows this will be a long afternoon. By round eight, Johnson is having the time of his life. Tired Burns answers the bell for round 14. Johnson pours it on. Lifts, rights, hooks, uppercuts. Burns is defenseless. At this very moment, the police shut off the cameras and stop the fight. Afterwards, famous novelist Jack London, who was covering the fight for the New York Herald, wrote that Jim Jeffries was the only man who could defeat Johnson and rescue the white race. The words which were used to describe the outcome embodied the deep-seated racial tensions of the day Jack Johnson had accomplished what no black man had before him. But even though he was a hero among his own people, the white American public eagerly awaited his downfall. So after four no decisions in an exhibition fight, there was a chance for a little bit more money and a little bit more show business. A fight with the popular middleweight champion, Stanley Ketchell. There was a lot of money up for grabs because there was a film up for grabs. It happened on October 16, 1909 in Colma, California. Jack Johnson's first heavyweight title defense was against middleweight champion Stanley Ketchell. Johnson wanted to fight undefeated former champion James J. Jeffries, but through 1909, the great white hope remained retired. The press also criticized Jack for not defending against black contender Sam Langford. They felt that Johnson was now giving Langford the same treatment Burns and Jeffries had given him. With this controversial backdrop, Jack Johnson readied himself for Stanley Ketchell. The champion outweighed the challenger by 35 pounds.
Stanley Ketchell posed at the signing wearing an oversized padded coat and five-inch heels on his cowboy boots to diminish the size difference. But Jack Johnson could not be fooled. The champion had apparently agreed to one condition set by Ketchell's manager, Willis Brick. It was that Jack would carry the Michigan assassin for 20 rounds to protect Stanley's reputation as middleweight champion. Even though Johnson consented to do so, Ketchell made one crucial mistake. The heavyweight champion of the world was unable to keep the agreement. October 16th, 1909. Rumor has it that Johnson will carry Ketchell to make it look good for the cameras. The first suspicion of a fix in Jack Johnson's career, but not the last. When Ketchell appears in the ring, minus shoulder pads and cowboy boots, the physical differences are startling. of blows and Ketchell goes down. By round nine, Ketchell is exhausted. Courage, raw courage keeps him on his feet. begins to show blood. Johnson stands off and flicks stinging left jabs. Ketchell looks for that one punch. Johnson steps back from a wild left and then ties up the challenge. Ketchell throws an overhand right, and Johnson goes down. Ketchell has done it. Johnson rolls over and rises. And then lightning strikes. Ketchell is down. Never has a heavyweight championship fight ended with such sudden turnaround. When a reporter asked Jack Johnson how he felt when Stanley had dropped him to the canvas, he said, far better than Ketchell did 30 seconds later. He crossed me, and I made him pay for it. Willis Britt, Ketchell's manager, died shortly after the fight, overcome by the tragedy which had befallen his fighter. Jack Johnson later said he feared that the punch landed hard enough to kill the middleweight champion. Instead, it was disclosed that all of Stanley Ketchell's upper and lower teeth were snapped at the roots. If you look closely, you can see Jack Johnson wipe two of Ketchell's teeth from his glove. With one powerful right, Jack Johnson had sent a message to James J. Jeffries. He was ready for any great white hope game enough to step through the ropes. The battle of the century had become inevitable. James J. Jeffries was urged by Jack London and many others to come out of retirement to regain the heavyweight championship for the white race. It was five long years since James J. Jeffries had been an active prize fighter. In 1904, he had scored a second round knockout of Jack Monroe. By 1910, he was working on his farm, having ballooned in weight to 320 pounds. He retired in 1905 as an unbeaten heavyweight champion, 
and at the age of 35, it was felt that only the fabled boiler maker from California could rescue the crown from Jack Johnson. James Jeffries had to keep a vibrant sense of humor to combat the obvious public pressure. The ex-champion's victory over Bob Fitzsimmons in 1899 to capture the heavyweight championship and his convincing knockout of former champion James J. Corbett in 1900 were only memories. The great white hope had a long battle to endure. The fight of the century was masterminded by professional gambler Tex Rickard. He outbid six prospective promoters by guaranteeing both fighters a total purse of $170,000. Rickard tried to stage the fight in California, but Governor Gillette threatened to call in the militia if any further efforts were made. Both Jack Johnson and James Jeffries were given a $10,000 bonus by Tex Rickard, and to induce the fighters to accept his bid, he placed $20,000 in gold pieces on the table. Rickard wanted to stage the official signing in the Hotel Albany in New York for maximum press exposure. But when Police Commissioner Baker threatened arrest, the site was moved across the river to a hotel in Hoboken, New Jersey. Originally, the winner's share was set at 75% of the total purse, but then James Jeffries insisted on a 60-40 split. Johnson's final take amounted to $120,000, an astronomical figure in 1910. Rickard went to his home state of Nevada. Reno businessmen aided in constructing a suitable arena for the fight. So both fighters set up training camps in nearby areas. Jeffries built a handball court in order to shed 90 pounds. Within six months, an overweight ex-champion had to be transformed into a viable contender. Early on, James Jeffries was made the favorite by professional gamblers and boxing experts. Ex-champion James Corbett was brought in to work with Jeffries. And after a series of brutal workouts witnessed by an adoring public and Mrs. James Jeffries, the ex-champion readied himself for the battle of the century. The entire country was mesmerized by the desire of one man who earned the now infamous title, The Great White Hope. Reports were surfacing that Jack was in the best shape of his ring career. It was repeatedly stated that Jack Johnson was seeking sweet revenge for the many years that Jeffries had denied him a title shot. The press buildup was as spectacular as any in the history of sports. Reno. Sporting fans rush to Reno. Even the amphitheater made of yellow pine has been carted over the mountains from California. It's as if some gigantic Greek drama is about to unfold. For Johnson, it is the final lap. He spars with veteran Al Kaufman. But there is a time for work and a time for play. As July approaches, Reno becomes the hub of the universe. The Johnson Club, a place to quench a thirst and place a bet. descend on Reno. On the day before the fight, a thousand of the faithful pay to see Jeffrey's train. to Jeffrey's camp. The New York Times correspondent, none other than John L. Sullivan, the bulky man on the right. Sullivan spars with gentleman Jim Corbett. In the cause of solidarity, all must be forgiven. So ends a 17-year feud between these legendary figures. Mm -hmm. 
On the day of the fight, trains arrive every half hour. High society comes in private cars, lending a touch of elegance rare on the prairie. A complete sellout. At precisely three minutes to one, Jack Johnson makes his way to the ring. Johnson is always the first to enter. So seriously does he take this ritual that it's written into his contract. The nation comes to a standstill as cameras grind away. A roar goes up. Now, Jeffrey, the crowd goes wild. This is a new age of instant communication. For the first time ever, a round-by-round round account relayed across country by telegraphers key. Round one, 45 rounds, the battle of the century. The action is tentative, cautious. Two champions, one old and coaxed out of retirement, are cleaned as the great white hope. The other, proud and outspoken, a man who has aroused the nation. The third man is Tex Rickard, impresario extraordinary. While outside, hundreds unable to buy tickets await the outcome. Jeffries bears the reputation of being the strongest man ever to enter the ring. In Jeffrey's corner, Corbett yells, one, two, Jeff, one, two. <laughs> Around seven, Jeffries is beginning to show frustration. Each time he launches an attack, Johnson quickly stifles it. And his frustration is compounded by Johnson's taunts. It's all on film for the world to see. And high overhead, a desert sun scorches the canvas. The temperature is rising, and so are tempers. The bell rings for round 15. Vicious uppercut and three stinging lips. Jeffries goes down. The great white hope lies gasping against the rope. It is as if a moment in time has stopped. A right uppercut. Three quick lefts. Get up, Jeff. Get up. Johnson moves in, but Rickard waves him off. Slowly, Jeffries rises. Johnson unloads a thunderous left, and Jeffries goes through the rope. The motions wave the rules as Jeffries is helped to his feet. Johnson moves in to finish it. finally collapses from a combination of blows. Johnson's stunning win over Jeffries signified much more than a heavyweight championship. It was the cause of an outbreak of racial violence across the country. Jack Johnson was living in an era which was finding it difficult to accept a black heavyweight champion. The memories of that day are buried amongst the scrap metal of what is now a junkyard on the original site of the fight here at 4th and Tawano Streets in Reno. All that's left to commemorate that event is a rather nondescript plaque that goes largely unnoticed on a busy street at a busier time. But Howard, on that night, 4th and Tawano Streets had a volatile reaction, not only here in Reno, but in fact all across the country. There was an extremely volatile reaction across the country. There were shootings, there were race riots, there were many deaths, there were many injuries. Here, the atmosphere was as if an execution had taken place. People slunk away. Uh, among the slinkers were pickpockets who left behind them on the street tin watches, 
they had kept the gold and silver watches which they had taken to the fight, but the tin watches they discarded were worthless. And that was the scrap metal at, after the fight of July 4th, 1910. The conversation goes on, Howard, that Jack Johnson was being victimized by the government. And to that end, a law was enacted after the johnson Jeffries fight here that disallowed the interstate transportation of the film of the fight. So it not only made Jack Johnson a non-person, it made the fight a non-event. It was a pathetic attempt to do that. They didn't want that fight, that knockdown, that knockout to be seen by, by the mass of America. Everyone knew that it had taken place, but the existence of it on film, I think it was Congress, wanted it forbidden to be shown. And the legal maneuverings didn't end there it either. It didn't end there at all. In fact, six or eight northern states had bills proposed in their houses of legislature to forbid interracial marriages. This was a direct uh, response to Johnson's victory and his liaisons with white women. How did Jack Johnson react to all of this himself as a person? How did the man react? Obliviously, as if none of it had happened. He went on to Chicago to open his Café de Champagne. And he did that, and he partied, and he did some performances, but what he did not do was fight for two years to the day until a fight in Las Vegas, New Mexico, against someone named Fireman Jim Flynn. It had been two long years since Jack Johnson had defended his crown. Fireman Jim Flynn was knocked out by the champion in 1907, but he represented the latest white hope. Promoted Jack Curley guaranteed Jack Johnson $30,000 for his fourth title defense. But clearly this was not the same man who defeated James Jeffries in 1910. Jack was out of shape. Life had become a non-stop party during his layoff. A group of clergymen, prosecutors, and detectives began working with a grand jury to scrutinize his private life. Jack was told he was being investigated, but he made no effort to change his free and easy lifestyle. His white wife, Etta Dourier, lived with the miseries of public rejection. It was a difficult time for the heavyweight champion. Jack Johnson and fireman Jim Flynn converged on Las Vegas, New Mexico in the summer of 1912. Because of the recent ban on the transport of fight films, promoter Jack Curley had trouble finding a crew to record the fight. Even with a two-year drought, boxing fans were not starving for a fight between an out-of-shape champion and a lightly regarded challenger. Only 5,000 people came to the arena, but thankfully local authorities relented and permitted Jack Curley to film the bout. On July 4th, 1912, Jack Johnson returned to the ring. Round one. Promoter Curley has found someone to man his camera. July 4th, 1912, exactly two years since Johnson sent Jim Jeffries into oblivion. But time has indulged his ringmanship. Give Johnson an audience, even a sparse one, and he rises to the occasion. When it places him, Johnson lands rapier punches on the pretender to his throne. is completely demoralized. Skeptics might find it hard to believe that this same Jim Flynn, five years later, will flatten Jack Dempsey in a single round. Exasperated and determined to do damage, Flynn leaves his feet and propels his head under the champion's chin. The referee has words with the challenger. Referee is exasperated. 
We're using Marcus of Queensbury rules, the referee cautions. I want both of you to follow the rules. Still using his head and Johnson, his defensive skills. Again, Flynn goes into this strange choreography. This time, the referee has much sterner words. What's this? A fourth man enters the ring. It's the sheriff who lost the proceedings. So once again, Jack Johnson wins by police intervention. After the fight, when Jack returned home to Chicago, his wife, Etta, suddenly committed suicide. Then in November of 1912, Jack Johnson was put under federal indictment on the grounds that he transported a white woman, Ms. Bell Shriver, across several state lines. This violation of the Mann Act of 1910 was passed in Congress to crack down on prostitution. And for four days, the heavyweight champion of the world was in jail. When he got out on bail, he had a jail sentence hanging over his head. Jack Johnson continued to defy the reformers. He married another white woman, Lucille Cameron, almost guaranteeing a stiff jail term. Within four months, Jack Johnson was on trial. In May of 1913, Jack Johnson was found guilty of violating the Mann Act and sentenced to one year and one day in a Joliet, Illinois penitentiary. He was also fined $1,000. Jack was terribly bitter, and he decided to jump bail. When he left the United States with his wife, Lucille, he promised it would be forever. The champion traveled to Canada, France, and finally England as the world's most famous fugitive. Jack Johnson was still the heavyweight champion of the world, but at this time in his life, he was a man without a country. Finally, Howard, there was a fight made with Jess Willard, a challenger whom the white community deemed had a pretty good chance to beat Jack Johnson, would not embarrass them. And even then, there was controversy surrounding the fight. There was some talk that perhaps a promise had been made to Jack Johnson that he would be pardoned if he tanked the fight. Johnson himself aroused this controversy uh, by saying that he had been made such an offer if he threw the fight. Uh, the fact of the matter is, as I'm sure the films will bear out, that he fought as hard as he could for 20 rounds. He fought his heart out against this enormous white fighter, very clumsy white fighter, and, and that he lost legitimately. I think Johnson was unable to bear the idea of having his own followers, his wife, uh, uh, the people close to him, think that he fought his heart out and lost. So Jack Johnson was a loser. Jess Willard was now the heavyweight champion of the world, and there wasn't to be another black challenger for 22 years. April 5th, 1915. Jack Johnson was a 37-year-old heavyweight champion. Promoter Jack Curley convinced him to fight Jess Willard. Johnson had never even heard of this giant of a man. This farmer from Kansas was six foot six inches tall and weighed 260 pounds. Curley assured Jack that Willard posed no threat to the crown. The site was Havana, Cuba. Federal authorities threatened to take the champion into custody if he set foot in the U.S. Curley promised Jack there would be no interference from American marshals. With a cloud of political controversy hanging over the champion's head, Jess Willard seemed even more of an insurmountable opponent. The challenger trained for Johnson as never before. He was ready to go the full 45 rounds. Jack was out of shape. He figured Willard to be yet another great white pretender. Jack Johnson was guaranteed $30,000 and was told by Jack Curley that a possible pardon could be arranged if he agreed to his figure. The champion demanded the money at the weigh-in, but Curley promised its delivery to his wife at ringside. So as the challenger departed for Mariano Racetrack, Jack Johnson pondered his future. He knew he was unable to return to his country, and as an aging champion, he had to anticipate a troublesome battle with Jess Willard. By rail, by car, on foot, a single destination, Oriental Park Racetrack. Though still morning, hundreds of early birds storm the gate for choice seats. Bat Masterson, the real Bat Masterson, 
once the fastest gun on the frontier, tips his hat for ticket buyers. Camera crews get ready. Umbrellas are already open to guard against the Caribbean sun. Hours before the fight, the protagonists are introduced. Jess Willard looks like an overgrown country boy in his Sunday best. Jack Johnson, a figure of continental elegance. The governor of Havana is given a place of honor in the shaded grandstand. Two hours later, a roar goes up as the champion makes his way to the ring. Temperature 103 and rising. At 37, Jack Johnson still clings to his superstition of being the first to enter the ring. Johnson is shown where his wife is seated. The moment of truth approaches. The challenger strides down the aisle. Now Willard enters the ring. Almost an apparition in dark pants, jacket, and hat. The fighters shake hands. On the scale for the weigh-in, Willard looks tough and trim. Johnson, the legendary Jack Johnson, no longer lean, no longer the classic champion of Sydney, Australia, and Reno, Nevada. The ritual of the gloves. First, the challenger. And then the champion puts on his gloves. April 5th, 1915. Round one. 45 rounds for the heavyweight championship of the world. Johnson is calm. He's been to the post before. He sees an opening and goes to his man. Willard ties him up and pushes off. Willard concentrates. This is the man who sent Jeffries into oblivion. The end of round one. It is hot and getting hotter. High overhead, the Cuban sun glares relentlessly. By round 10, it becomes a bitter struggle. Each man trying to establish superiority. Willard advances cautiously. Still the showman, Johnson spreads his gloves but the challenger ignores his cue. Willard is respectful. Johnson is a man like no other man. Round 26. The sun is insidious. Jess Willard has the will to win. Low muscles signal their discontent. Johnson finds the stamina to launch an attack. Leaning, pushing, shoving, holding on. sees Johnson's eyes. They tell him now is the time. Johnson goes down. It's happened. The crowd roars his approval. The impossible had come true. The search for the great white hope was over. Jack Johnson had been dethroned. A riot followed the fight. Delirious fans rejoiced over the new white heavyweight champion. 
Following the loss, reliable advisors told Jack to head back to Europe, fearing a prison term if he entered the U.S. Then after several weeks, Jack Johnson broke some startling news. He claimed the fight was fixed. A photograph was released of Jack apparently shading his eyes after the knockdown. The ex-champion made an affidavit in which he accused Jack Curley of paying him to lay down between rounds 10 and 20. Johnson asserted that Willard's poor performance carried the fight an extra six rounds. As evidence of the fix, Johnson pointed to the fact that his wife left ringside after the 25th round. He said a prearranged signal indicated the next round would be the last. Those in attendance felt Jack's story was a sham. Many experts felt Jack was making these declarations to get himself out of financial trouble. Public sentiment indicated that Jack Johnson had lost his title to the better fighter on that fateful day in 1915. We may never hear the true story. Jack was resigned to a life of exile in England, Spain, and Mexico until July 20th, 1920, when he surrendered to federal authorities in San Diego. On September 13th, Jack Johnson was ordered by Judge George Carpenter to serve one year and one day in the federal penitentiary in Leavenworth, Kansas. When he was released, he received roaring welcomes in Chicago and New York. But in the 20s, the celebrated ex-champion was resigned to the life of flea circuses and small-time vaudeville. Jack Johnson was nothing more than a showpiece drifting into poverty. But Jack Johnson was not desperate for self-esteem. He still had the desire to speak and work for his country. Churchgoers, black improvement associations, and even the Ku Klux Klan gathered to listen to the former heavyweight champion. I want to say a few words in regard to boxing here today. I should not be here, but I am here. I want to do something good. And out of doing that something good, something will come good to me. Now then, I am boxing a fellow here, Joe Jeanette, who some 35 for 40 years ago, Joe and I used to have some tough scraps. But even so, with all of our fights, we have retained our friendship. 1945. Johnson is 67. Jeanette, 71. A war bond rally is held in New York. Jack Johnson, now recognized as the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Before Johnson was champion, he fought Joe Jeanette nine times. Now a nostalgic reunion. Jeanette never got a chance at the title. Jack Johnson raised funds for a country which was his again. When Jack spoke, he would touch on religion, squareness, courage, and successful living. Clearly, he was not bitter over a less than glittering past. Jack did not want to judge his own past actions or those who found fault with his controversial lifestyle. He was merely trying to convey a sense of hope and understanding to those Americans living in a new era. But even though Jack's thoughts and actions seemed to mellow in his later years, he still had one severe shortcoming. The ex-champion had built up an inner anger and arrogance over the years, which he displayed whenever behind the wheel of a car. On June 10, 1946, Jack Johnson crossed the border of North Carolina en route to the Joe Lewis Billy Kahn fight in New York. Traveling on US-1, Jack lost control of the car and it went off the shoulder of the road. He turned to avoid an oncoming truck and instead crashed into a power pole. He was rushed to St. Agnes Hospital in Raleigh, North Carolina, where he died from internal injuries three hours later. The world had lost the first black man ever to win the heavyweight title. On June 14th, thousands of blacks and whites stood outside the Pilgrim Baptist Church in Chicago, mourning the loss. Inside, the Reverend Junior Caesar Austin Sr. addressed the crowd of 2,500. Jack struck a double blow when he became heavyweight champion. If we hadn't had a Jack, we wouldn't have a Joe Lewis now. That statement was probably the best epitaph for a life that was constantly marred by supposed arrogance. Many people denounced and detested him, but for many others, 
Jack Johnson's career was a source of both pride and inspiration. Maybe he was a victim of the times, but that's the price one must pay when you are the first black man ever to win the heavyweight championship of the world. Jack Johnson, his legend will live forever. So the city of New York, and in fact the boxing world, will no longer have Jack Johnson to malign. And Jimmy Jacobs, here we are 36 years later, and after a play and a movie and a couple of books and all the other words that have been written and spoken about Jack Johnson, it does seem that the man is starting to get his place in boxing history. I would say so, Barry. Uh, Jack Johnson, unquestionably, is one of the great heavyweight champions of all time. And there is no doubt that around the turn of the century, Jack Johnson was the greatest heavyweight champion of all time. Is there a comparison to a contemporary fighter, at least in boxing style, if not personality, that could be made to Jack Johnson? I would say the closest thing to Jack Johnson would have been Muhammad Ali. Uh, both Jack Johnson and Muhammad Ali attempted to get the job done without getting hurt, without getting punched. And that's, I, I believe that's a marvelous comparison between the two. Jimmy, comes now the catch-all question. In the great scheme of things, and you, of course, as we mentioned at the top of this program, the preeminent boxing authority as far as the history of the sport, where do you put Jack Johnson amongst the great champions? Barry, I would say that Jack Johnson, certainly Jack Johnson was the greatest heavyweight champion in the first 20 years of this century. Each generation of boxers uses the accumulated knowledge of their pre predecessors as a jumping off point for further development. So I would say that Jack Johnson, of the 28 heavyweight champions we've had, Jack Johnson would certainly be in the top three of all time. It is, of course, the be-all subjective question. Who is the greatest of all time? It is a question that will be asked as long as the boxing world goes around. For Howard Sackler and Jimmy Jacobs, I'm Barry Tompkins, and we'll see you next time on Boxing's Best. league in the world for a reason more memorable moments from the barclays premier league coming next on espn classic